Ready to do it. Welcome to The Front Porch, the official podcast of Empower Mississippi. I am Brett Kittredge. The man next to me is Russ Latino. Uh, we're here to just talk a little bit about what's going on in the United States, talk about what's going on in Mississippi. We'll get into income tax repeal, what's going on in the legislature, upcoming hearings, talk in a more sombering note, what has happened in Afghanistan, what might be happening, and then we'll end talking a little bit about the Field of Dreams game in Iowa that baseball, Major League Baseball played last week, a very cool event. But first, Russ, let's talk about nurse practitioners, similar to uh, the income tax uh, repeal fight, nurse practitioner expansion was before the legislature passed out of the House last session. Tell us a little bit about where that is, why this is so important. Well, I want to take a step back, first of all, and just acknowledge the fact that nurses, doctors, members of the healthcare profession in general have done real yeoman's work over the last year and a half. I mean, they've been put in a situation that could not have been anticipated with COVID-19. Um, obviously, we're currently going through another flare-up with the Delta variant, uh, and those guys are just doing an incredible job dealing with the strain on the system uh, relative to the need of the population, and so they're to be commended for the effort and um, the energy that they're putting in on behalf of patients. I think even before COVID, though, there was a ton of conversation in our country around the future of healthcare. Certainly different viewpoints on uh, what it was going to take to fix what a lot of people saw as a broken system. And sort of my viewpoint has always been the goal of a healthcare system should be affordable care, um, you know, that's accessible to most people. And, you know, one of the problems that we've got in the country is right now, we're projected to have a doctor shortage of about 100,000 physicians across the country by the year 2030. In Mississippi, we're actually projected to have the worst situation of all states. Uh, we will be the only F-rated state when it comes to access to physician care uh, by 2030, about 3,700 doctors short in the state. And that's particularly a huge number when you consider that right now there are only about 5,000 um, active physicians and about a third of those are nearing the point of retirement. So the question really is given the existing access to care gap that we've got in the state and the fact that the problem is predicted to get a lot worse, how do we fill that gap to make sure that people have access to quality care at a price they can afford? And I think nurse practitioners play a really pivotal role in answering that question. Okay, I know nurse practitioners already play a very big role, right? I mean, when I go to a you know a clinic that you just sort of a drop-in type clinic, I'm seen by a nurse practitioner. A local clinic is run by a nurse practitioner under a medical doctor. So talk a little bit about what nurse practitioners are already doing and sort of some of that role they're filling in rural areas. Yeah, so right now in all 50 states, nurse practitioners are allowed to prescribe medication. Uh, a nurse practitioner is someone who's generally been in the practice of nursing for six to eight years, and then they go back and they get a master's degree uh, essentially in one of four um, advanced practice specialties. Um, and so really what they're primarily doing is providing primary care. So in all 50 states, giving uh, the ability to give prescriptions. In most states, the ability to see patients without the presence of a physician, which is true in Mississippi. And then in about half the states, nurse practitioners have what's called full practice authority. And that's the policy that the legislature considered last year. And it really is recognizing what is already true, which is in the state of Mississippi, nurse practitioners are already providing primary care, basically at a two to one ratio of primary care physicians. So if you go in a clinic today in Mississippi, there's a very good chance that you're not going to see a primary care physician, that you will in fact see a nurse practitioner. And by and large, those people are delivering really high quality care to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to it. So what would need to change? So what is the holdup then for nurse practitioners to be able to? Yeah, so, so full practice authority is just essentially removing a regulatory hurdle. Right now, uh, nurses are required to pay physicians, in some cases thousands of dollars per month, uh, for the physician agreeing to review either 10% of the charts or 20 charts, whichever is less, of the patients that nurse practitioner sees. And so in many cases, you have a patient that comes in, you know, they've got a sore throat, they get treated by a nurse practitioner, they're, they're better 
and weeks later a physician may happen to pick up their chart and look at it and say, well, this looks, this looks okay. Um, now, that may not sound like a bad safeguard unless you realize that that sort of retrospective review of a very small percentage of charts uh, creates a cost that makes it more difficult for NPs to provide primary care. So the states where that is not a requirement are states that have seen a tremendous increase in the number of nurse practitioners providing primary care, but particularly in rural areas, you also see the cost of those evaluations come down, which means greater access to care. And then Duke University did a study in the states that have done this, and what they found is that patients reported satisfaction at or better than the level of other uh, primary care settings. And so there's no drop off in quality, you've got a, a lowering of cost, and you tend to have a greater supply of care available to people. That's particularly important in a state like Mississippi. Well, that was going to be my question was, is there a change of care? Is this a potential harm to consumers? No, I mean, you know, all the data out there suggests one that's not true, but I mean, some of it is just using common sense. And you think about the nature of a primary care visit, there are really three purposes. You can uh, identify a minor ailment that can be taken care of with an antibiotic or prescription or something like that. Uh, you can identify or treat a chronic ailment like hypertension or diabetes, which nurse practitioners are, are well qualified to do. Or you can identify that there's something serious and you essentially refer that person out to a specialist. Um, so the nature of primary care is not a high risk practice. And you see that in the, the fact that the vast majority of visits with medical professions are those primary care visits, but medical malpractice claims are really low compared to other specialties. And so some of it's just a risk analysis. The risk is relatively low um, and the bigger risk is not having access to care. Um, not ac having access to regular primary care is what ultimately leads to, in a state like Mississippi, the worst life expectancy in the country, a full four years shorter than the national average. You know, one thing you mentioned was the cost. Like, we've talked to nurse practitioners who say things like, the cost of having the physician is the cost of rent in my own clinic. That, that's an impediment to starting my own clinic. We also have situations like a nurse practitioner who, the doctor who was her, you know, the physician over her, retired and was left yeah, and that happens all the time, right? Where, where an agreement uh, lapses for one reason or another, doctor retires. In some cases, doctors have been sanctioned by their own licensing authority and, and not allowed to do supervision anymore. And in those cases, you've got patients that are waiting to be seen by their regular healthcare provider who literally can't be seen because there's no longer someone technically supervising. That's a negative impact on patients. It's a negative impact on businesses. And to your point, it prevents people from investing in their own businesses. It also prevents banks and lending institutions from making those decisions because if they know a business can get shut down at any moment, not because of the operator, but because of someone outside of the operator, it creates a risk. Switching gears, uh, legislature worked on nurse practitioner expansion last year. They also worked on income tax repeal. That's going to continue to come back. That's certainly something we support at Empower. We put out a report earlier this year talking about how and why that would work and why we really need to do it in Mississippi. Talk a little bit about what's going on with that. Talk about the hearings that are coming up in a week. Yeah, so the legislature is set to have uh, joint hearings with the Senate and the House, sort of a select group of, of representatives and senators in both chambers that'll be meeting next week with uh, state economists, uh, some national experts on tax policy to consider, you know, what next steps look like. Obviously, the House of Representatives passed a bill out of their chamber that would have eliminated the income tax. But I think what we said all along is that was a great start to a broader conversation that needs to happen. Um, that bill certainly has some good bones to it. I think for this to be successful long term, you're going to have to see larger buy-in. Uh, the public has got to understand the benefit that is uh, available to them. I think business groups have to understand the benefit ultimately to the economy. And then you've got to have political buy-in, right? People need to see uh, that they have an opportunity to have input and ultimately to help shape what, what gets across the finish line. So you've got to have the Senate uh, bought in, you've got to have the governor bought in. And I think this, uh, this hearing date, or two, two days of hearings essentially, is a good start to that. It's a good opportunity for other people to kind of put their mark on the, on the conversation. That'll be a pause. Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about income tax repeal, why, why we support it. What, what do you see as the good to come from it besides just people saving money? 
So the devil's in the details, right? It matters how you do it. But if it can be done well, the elimination of the income tax is a bold move that I think puts Mississippi in a more competitive place. And I'm not basing that off of sort of mindless speculation. I'm basing it off of the fact that we know there are nine states that operate without an income tax. And by and large, those nine states are thriving in a way that not only puts Mississippi to shame economically, but puts the rest of the country to shame economically. You've seen GDP growth that far outpaces national average in those nine states, which is the size of the overall economy. Uh, you've seen wage growth that's, uh, that's outpacing averages across the country. And most importantly, you've seen population growth uh, that is more than double the national average over the last 10 years in the states that don't have income taxes. And so people are literally moving with their feet and they're bringing capital with them. Um, and that's, that's a you know, sort of injection or, or surplus into the economy that can't be undersold. I mean, I think I said this last week, there has never once been an economy that's grown without population growth. Well, Mississippi is losing population. We're one of three states that over the last decade have lost population. Uh, and to make matters worse, if you really look at the, the details of the population inflows and outflows in Mississippi, uh, we are losing the portion of the population that is productive, the portion of the population that is working age, and we are gaining a portion of the population that is at retirement. Well, that's a great thing that retirees see Watch Mississippi as a, as a good place to live, but the balance has got to be such that you've got more people pulling the cart, not fewer people pulling the economic cart. And right now we're at real risk of, of losing more and more people that are pulling that car. So the, the income tax policy is something that we've had economists look at. Uh, we've worked with national partners that work on tax policy. And we believe that it can create more jobs. We believe that it can create uh, higher paying jobs. We believe that it can uh, create a larger, more vibrant economy. And part of that is the attraction of people into the state. And if you start in a place where you're one of a handful that aren't, aren't doing so well, uh, it's important that you're willing to take those kind of bold steps. And I'm being a little facetious when I ask this, but one of the concerns or complaints or whatever you want to call it from opponents is it'll gut government. So tell us how that's not true. Tell us how these states, I mean, you sort of mentioned it. Uh, Tennessee, Florida, Texas are rel our neighbors relatively close to us, some very close to us. I mean, how, how are these states doing? How are they doing? With, how are they getting by without an income tax? Yeah, so the crazy thing is, if you look at Mississippi's tax burden, it's pretty high uh, as a percentage of our overall economy. If you look at the tax burden in the states that don't have income taxes, it's a ba basically half of what Mississippi's is on average, the tax burden. So you would say, okay, well, they're collecting a lot less in taxes. And the answer to that is no, they're not. <coughs> State revenue is actually growing in those states. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because their actual economy, their private sector economy, it's growing at a pace that far eclipses ours. So lower tax burden, but a government that is actually getting funded at a higher rate year by year because the economy itself is growing. And that's the scenario that you want to play out, not necessarily a larger government. Uh, but a recognition that you can fund the things that you need in government assuming the private economy is working the way it's supposed to. What do you hope to see at the hearings next week? You know, I hope it's an open discussion. Uh, I hope people don't come in so tied into their own ideas about the way that this has to be done that there's not room for some maneuvering. Uh, I said earlier that the devil's in the details. I think that's true. I mean, I think obviously one of the goals of this should be to keep our taxes as low as possible, our overall tax burden as low as possible to afford the government. I think it's got to be a broad-based tax policy. It shouldn't be put on the shoulders of one group of people. I think it's got to be simple and transparent, and that's one of the nice things about consumption or sales taxes, is that you don't have all the complexity of income taxes. Um, and I think it's get to the extent possible needs to be behavior neutral, which is saying that you don't implement taxes that affect certain industries or certain products in a way more harshly than the rest of the economy. You, you truly trust the free market to work by taxing people at a relatively flat rate. And I'll just, I'll, unless you have something else, I'll end with, you know, Louisiana this year had some reform. Obviously they didn't repeal their income tax. They are lowering their top income tax below ours. So it's sort of, you know, we live in a federalist society. We compete against every other state. Do they pay you for that? The reference to the federalist society? <laughs> it's not, we live in a there. federalist society, different from the federalist society. 
Um, no, like, and like look, them both. But I, I would say this: there are states across the country that are implementing good yeah. tax reform right now, yeah. and I think part of it is a response to what's happening in D.C. States are saying, "Fine, we will be laboratories of democracy. We're going to try and do things at the state level that makes us more effective." And Mississippi, to be competitive, is going to have to take some bold steps. Uh, not only from you know starting at the status quo, but the recognition that other people are out and running. Louisiana is a great example of that. Switching from state policy, obviously we've seen images out of Afghanistan, out of the capital, um, of uh, the Taliban essentially taking over, people leaving, um, lots of comparisons to Saigon many years ago. It's hard to believe we've been in Afghanistan for 20 years. Hard to believe 9-11 will be 20 years ago this September. Where are we? What, what do you see happening or what has happened in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say you're right. It is strange to think it's been 20 years that since 9-11. I've been a lot. I've been alive more than, you know, I've spent more years alive yeah. than in Afghanistan. No, and, I mean, and same for you. It, it's incredible. So I was yeah. I was heading into my junior year at Tulane okay. uh, when 9-11 happened. I can vividly remember uh, watching it unfold on a 13-inch TV VCR combo. Uh, in <laughs> Did my, it get rolled in? Yeah, in, in my dorm room. <laughs> and... Um, and just being an utter shock, like like so many Americans, and thinking about the fact that it's been 20 years is hard. Um, you know, obviously there was good reason for the United States to engage in Afghanistan in 2001. Um, it made sense to catch the people who were responsible for one of the worst tragedies on U.S. soil in U.S. history, um, and it also made sense to try and you know. Uh, cripple them, for lack of a better way to put it, to render them incapable of, of having those same sorts of attacks on U.S. assets and on U.S. soil. I think it became harder over the years once you had a bin Laden, once you had al-Qaeda uh, largely dismantled, it became harder over the years to understand uh, the risks that we were putting American soldiers in. And so, you know, there have been multiple administrations, Republican and Democrat, that have talked about the need to unwind and bring troops home from, from Afghanistan. I think the larger question that's unfolded in the last 72 hours is not whether or not withdrawal was appropriate at some stage. It's the execution of the withdrawal. Um, and watching you know people flock to Kabul airport uh, and flood those runways and hang on to airplanes for dear life falling off. I mean, it was, it was eerily reminiscent of the people falling Jumping out of buildings at 9-11, at right? Tower. Yeah. Um, so it's a tragic circumstance. I mean, I, I think where I come down on it is the goal of withdrawal and ultimately allowing Afghanistan to be a sovereign nation was a good goal. The execution was really poor. And I think right now there's a larger humanitarian concern, Brett, in that there are thousands and thousands of people who signed on the dotted line and risked their life that are Afghans for the United States and the United States mission. and it, I. For me, it's very important that we not leave those people in a situation with a wolf at their door, unprotected. Um, there's got to be a solution uh, for those folks who risked everything for the United States. What would you say that solution is besides trying to get them to the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably a variety of solutions, but I think some of it includes the understanding that if ever there was a case for asylum, that case is there for people who were interpreters or contractors and people who put their lives and the lives of their family at risk for, the, for our country and our country's objectives there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it is just weird, weird in that it feels like the war in Afghanistan, the conflict in Afghanistan, whatever, has been such a back page thing, right? You haven't even thought about it for years most of the time. And then all of a sudden you have this just sort of front and center. Uh, it's, it's but I, I also think it's a good time to reflect on the fact that we had you know 2,600 casualties over the last 20 years uh, of American soldiers. Yeah. Um, 20,000 that were injured there. You had 69,000 Afghans that have lost their lives um, trying to restore some semblance of normalcy there. Um, and then you know as a government we spent 2.6 trillion dollars over the last 20 years in Afghanistan. And so. Um, Certainly the exit has left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth, but now more than ever I think it's time to reflect on 
what does our foreign policy look like in the future? What are the rules of engagement for entangling uh, in the future? And I would argue that you know, clear objectives that are easily met with the right resources and then a plan to leave is pretty important. And it felt like the last you know, decade or so there really wasn't a good exit plan. Yeah, we were just sitting there basically. Um, which, yeah, to see what happened. What do you think will happen in the days ahead? You know, I, I will say it appears that they've they've retaken sort of uh, order around the airport, and so to me, if anything, that's that's, that's more damning in that it shows that had they planned well, you wouldn't have had the experience that you had a few nights ago. Um, you know, I, I think the message to the Taliban's got to be pretty clear: you're going to let us get our assets out, you're going to let us get the people who need to be protected out uh, and into safe conditions, and if you don't, there's going to be consequences, and they've got to believe that, right? Uh, I think weakness invites confrontation, which doesn't mean that you've got to be there permanently, but I think it's, it means that people have to know that you're going to protect your own. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is, the, the 20 years part's really what gets to you, um, really, when you think about it. One of the things, shortly after 9-11, uh, that I vividly remember, I know you do too, is George Bush throwing out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium, game three of the It's one of the greatest World moments Series. ever. Yeah. It really, no, I'm serious. Like, he strolls to the mound like a boss and throws a strike yeah. right down the middle. And this is like, you know, a month after 9 11, and the entire stands just start chanting USA. And, you know, it, it's it's horrible, but out of adversity oftentimes is when we're united. Yeah. Um, and you think about how divided we are as a country. In that moment, we were so united as a country. It was pretty cool. That was a very cool baseball moment. Speaking of another cool baseball moment, last week, played a Major League Baseball game in Iowa for the first time ever. Played it on the set, or where Field of Dreams was filmed. It wasn't a set. It's an actual place, actual house, ball field that... Major League Baseball built up really for them to to play at. Had the players walk through the cornfields in the outfield. Just a neat setting. Yeah, and it was incredible. Also involving my Yankees, by the way. I may be the only like mid hardcore Mississippian who's a Yankees fan, but I, I grew up a Yankees fan. Um, in part because all the Italian players, my dad grew up as a Yankees fan, and so it kind of got passed down. No, incredible setting, and, and look, I mean, in a way, it was quite literally corny, right? But, but, on, yeah, no, well, I'm not saying it's going, it, it was quite <laughs> literally corny, um, pun entirely intended, but it also, like, struck a chord, uh, the little boy inside of me that remembered Field of Dreams, yeah. you know, circa 1989, I uh, thought it was just a super cool moment, and the game couldn't have been any better, right? right? You get in the top of the ninth, the Yankees hit two two-run home runs uh, with two outs, and you're thinking, okay, for me, I was thinking, this is awesome, we're yeah. about to win this, and then the White Sox come back and hit a two-run dinger to, to end the that game in the sweet. bottom of the ninth. Um, yeah, super cool. I hope they'll do it again. They will. They will. The next year, the Reds and Cubs are playing. Oh, that, okay. That's been scheduled. That's pretty cool. Right online, which I know we've heard I mean, about they, the Cubs. They couldn't have found a better team than the Reds? Well, the well, Reds are like the oldest professional baseball team still and the Cubs have a minor league team in yeah, Iowa. Give, give, give me Red Sox Cubs the or something Iowa like Cubs. that you know, give me something real so I will say though the tickets to that game I don't know if you saw the cost but some of those tickets were going for three thousand yeah. dollars a pop yeah Woo. yeah I mean they sat eight thousand and everyone that's lying. high cotton Could've... but now I'm mixing metaphors <laughs> different different part of the country um, but yeah so Field of Dreams filmed there obviously they had the house in the background you know you can do cool stuff. You can go like spend the night at that house and whatnot for for a price. But Field of Dreams, a very cool baseball movie, sort of one of those. It's about baseball, but it's not. What are your thoughts? Favorite baseball movie? There's been a ton. Yeah, I mean, you know, I could go goofy like Major League, which is fun. Um, but I think my favorite baseball movie is probably The Natural. Uh, pretty up, pretty close up to that. Um, Billy Crystal did a movie about the hunt for. 61. Breaking uh, yeah. Babe Ruth's record, 61, about Maris and Mantle. Phenomenal movie about two great Yanks. Um, so um, that's pretty high up there. How about you? I'll go a little more um, childish. Basketball, or what was the name of the one? that? The, that yeah, that <laughs> was one. Um, I did not see that, but Sandlot. Um, it's just such a classic movie. It makes you 
even though we didn't grow up like that to where, you know, grow up in the 60s like the movie was set or whatever. It's just a neat, just a look back, a, a coming of age type movie. Did you ever pull that maneuver where you pretend uh, it like you were the drowned? The lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ever pull that as a kid? I, I don't know. I can't say that I did. So, funny story. So, I've started watching it with my boys. And um, my old, my older kids, I guess all my kids, but certainly my older kids will sit there and just watch baseball games, live baseball games all night if we let them. And so, but with Sandlot, what they didn't like was there were scenes besides baseball scenes. Sure. So, like, you know, Wendy Peppercorn wasn't that much of an interest to them as much as, you know, Rodriguez was, you know, Benny the Jet. So, um, just a cool movie. Just a, like, a, obviously a kid's movie. Um, good way to introduce kids. In the 90s, we had tons of baseball movies come yeah. out. Um, yeah, we can just keep talking about baseball, but... We can end it there. Um, any departing words? I'm done. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Uh, leave us a comment. Shoot us an email. Let us know what you think. We'll talk to you next week.